uh, our host, uh, the chief of the program for Dr. Callens and Natalie and myself to give you a more abbreviated lunch session right now. And you'll still have enough time to visit the exhibit booths. So the way we have rearranged this session, instead of a debate, we have structured it as an initial presentation that I'll be doing on the scientific basis of AFib ablation and some new data on rotor ablation uh, and the science and the questions that has brought up. And then we were hoping that Dr. Natali and Dr. Callens, uh, with a combination of slides and back and forth discussion, will be uh, making comments. And we'll still have time for audience response. So this is my hometown. We do have some hills, not as pretty as the ones you have here in Bogota. And uh, again, uh, you'll be seeing a lot of data that's being presented by some of my colleagues who are on this slide, and they help generate this data. So most of our fellowship funding, of course, comes from the American Heart National Institutes of Health. And I'd like to acknowledge them for the science that you're about to see. So what is the story of atrial fibrillation? Uh, our own group has, um, you know, we've spent most of our efforts in studying ventricular tachycardia, as you'll hear tomorrow. But we've not, uh, in fact, the whole field has not placed as much attention as it should have in the science of AFib. So we continue to have a major problem where we don't understand the mechanisms of AFib in humans. The mechanisms of ablative approaches especially is not clear. Why it works is not clear. We know it works. And last but not the least, use of ablation has increased. However, heterogeneity of patient population and complexity of therapy are the major issues. So uh, I've also taken the liberty to include some theoretical slides, mapping slides that comes from the research group at UCLA that's headed by Dr. James Wise. So what are the major landmarks in fibrillation research? At the outset, I can make a statement here which is probably not very shocking to this audience. To date, we do not know what fibrillation is. We have lots of theories, but we still don't understand what fibrillation is. The research story starts uh, over 100 years ago when George Ralph Mines uh, was using uh, rayfish and uh, atrial rings to study reentry. They are also used turtle hearts. And subsequently, uh, Walter Gary, who was working at Barnes Hospital at that time, came up with a very interesting hypothesis of a, for ventricular fibrillation. They used digoxin-like chemicals on an uh, explanted, isolated heart. And when it's exposed to these toxic chemicals, that piece of muscle would fibrillate. And if you start cutting the muscle into the smaller pieces, fibrillation would stop. And he developed this hypothesis called a critical mass, saying that there is a minimal amount of myocardium that's needed to sustain fibrillation. No matter what you could do beyond that level, you could not get fibrillation going. Then Gordon Moore proposed the multiple wavelength hypothesis in 1964 using a computer model, a uh, very initial computer model in the 60s, surprisingly. And then came the studies by Moritz Alessi, which still continues to be some of the most important studies done in this field. Then comes uh, the invasion of the field by uh, the mathematicians and the theoreticians. And there was a very path-breaking paper uh, manuscript that was written by Art Winfrey. Uh, it's, a, it's a very readable piece, actually, if any of you are interested in a long flight. It's called When Time Breaks Down. He started using mathematical phenomena to explain complex behavior. And that's when the whole concept of rotors and the spiral wave theory came about. And I'll be alluding to it a little bit more. Uh, an important landmark in the field has been Pepe Halife's description of experimentally showing this in optical mapping. But therein lies a very interesting sort of departure from reality because nobody has paid clear attention to the type of experiments that were done. These were optical mapping experiments where the hearts were explanted. They were tissue in thyroid solutions. It's not innovated. And it's also mapped in a way where electromechanical coupling is inhibited by using agents such as blebistatin. So it's a piece of muscle that is not doing the one thing the heart is supposed to do, and that is to contract. And that is an extremely artificial experimental setting where a rotor has been identified. And later, if we have some time, either during this session or later, 
We'll tell you why we think that rotors themselves are an experimentally, uh, almost an artifactual observation that is seen in less than 5% of the time <coughs> in extremely artificial conditions. And then comes um, you know, a lot of electrical and optical mapping by many investigators. And Pepe Halife proposed the mother rotor theory and mixed uh, EAD, DAD dependent theory was proposed by the group at UCLA, our theoretical experimental group. So we, the physicians and the physician scientists, are left with this proverbial problem, which is the uh, blind man and the elephant. This is uh, a poem by a famous American poet, actually, who talks about how people go around the elephant. And each one catches a part of the elephant and describes a different finding. So we still do not know what this beast is. So what are the definitions? Anatomic reentry, functional reentry, phase singularity, focal source dominant frequency. These terms, and I'm happy to eventually even make a printout of this because this comes all the time for fellows. If you have reentry around an obstacle or a scar, that is anatomic reentry. And I'd like to highlight that even that anatomic reentry cannot occur without functional control. That is point number one to file away. Point number, and the reason is simple, right? Everyone knows this. Typical flutter cannot sustain itself if you don't have an area of functional block. Then you have a whole process of functional reentrant phenomena, and we owe a lot to Moritz Alessi and others to have highlighted this and brought that into attention. Some of the other terms that you need to know about for the presentation that I'll be showing you is the terms like phase singularity and focal source. So phase singularity is the rotation center core of a rotor. If an impulse is going around, you'll actually get to a point which is the absolute center of it, which is referred to as a phase singularity. And the focal source is self-explanatory. And then dominant frequency is the frequency with the highest power in a FFT, which is a Fourier transform spectrum of any electrographic time series. And I'll show you why this is important and how this actually helped us understand what was going on. So this is uh, a picture representation of all the mechanisms we talked about. The details of this is not critical for this presentation, but this is mathematical modeling. And I can also show you some cartoons. But what happens in reality um, is very hard to sort out from what we see in the clinical setting. So uh, the two extremes of theories that you have to keep in mind is that is one major rotor that is going around, and that is controlling fibrillation. It's either stationary or keeps moving around. The other is multiple Babelet VF, which completely tells you that there are no rotors. Many different areas just go out of control, and they keep uh, sustaining the arrhythmia. So we, in the field of electrophysiology, do a whole lot of lesion sets in the atria. And we have no idea why it works. I can sit over here and philo philosophize and say, we do A and uh, B happens because we did A. That may not be true at all. But there could be a variety of things that we are targeting. But one thing is for real, because catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation has benefit. It does work. I mean, that is, there's been no doubt about it. And as it turns out, the finer points of how various people do this, which again highlights the need for such conferences, has improved success and safety of the procedure. So there's a whole lot of approaches that can be used for uh, management of atrial fibrillation. And let's um, start off with rotors, because that's the controversy. Rotors, of course, uh, uh, in the non-biology field, we owe a lot to these two gentlemen, Belizov and Zabonitsky, who independently actually described this phenomenon years apart. And it's called the BZ uh, reaction for that reason. And this is actually a chemical reaction. When you act chemicals in an experimental setting, spontaneous rotors form. Of course, people saw this and immediately wanted to come up with a biological interpretation. And one of the first studies was actually published by my colleague, Ravi Mandapati. At that time, he was in Pepe Halife's lab. And this was his first independent career papers, a series of papers, 
in which they used sheep atria and they did multi electrode mapping and optical mapping. Uh, most of the data that was reported eventually was the optical mapping data. And in this isolated sheet part, they were able to look at reentrant wavefronts that look like this. And they went on to identify these as rotors. They were short lived. And they were seen in a situation where there was extreme experimental control of the substrate. Now, then comes a very interesting uh, series of uh, studies. And uh, Sanjeev Narayan, who's a good friend of ours, at that time was at UCSD. He came up to UCLA and he said, uh, he has a new way of mapping rotors. And we were genuinely excited about this. Um, we were quite skeptical, even in the early days. But we just made a cool-headed assessment that even if a fraction, one in five cases, of atrial fibrillation can be mapped, and you had a mechanism that you could target, that would be extremely meaningful. And uh, we started a collaboration, and the first study that came out of this collaboration was a confirmed trial where uh, uh, the labs, our lab and Dr. Miller's lab were controls, because we collected the data, but we couldn't use that data for research. But subsequently, we did a series of 23 cases uh, prospectively using the system and our primary interest of doing that was to do the scientific analysis, which I'll be showing you in this presentation. For uh, some of you who may not have followed this or have looked at it closely, the way this works is basket catheters are placed in atria, RA and LA, and the electrograms are used to compute a, a potential rotor if one is present. So the way this has been shown is seen over here with multiple electrodes. It's a three-dimensional data set that's displayed in 2D. And some of the most riveting, and perhaps this is one of the very best rotors that we've ever seen. This is not recorded at UCLA. This was recorded at the UCSD VA. And this is the kind of a rotational activity that was now thought to control atrial fibrillation. There were major questions about this to begin with, because based on experimental studies, you simply could not have a path length and some of the variables that are given in a circuit to be of this size. But be as it may, we didn't help in the initial study, Dr. Miller and UCLA, our team, where we were provided controlled data for this. And subsequently, we did a series of five cases that were done as a initial study. Uh, and this included Dr. Alan Bogan's lab. And we saw acute results. We didn't see any terminations in those studies that the confirmed trial reported. And subsequently, we did a very careful series of prospective cases. And we actually invited Dr. Narayan to actually come to UCLA and teach us, because you know he's the one who knew the procedure the best. And he did 19 of those 23 cases. So confirmed trial, just to recapitulate, actually shows that if uh, you had firm guided ablation, you had extremely good outcomes. And many of these cases were followed by implanted devices. So there was good follow-up uh, available in these patients. But it's important to highlight this is not a prospective randomized study. And all the patients in the confirmed trial also had a concomitant PBI. So that is a major concern to keep in mind. So now let's look at the scientific analysis. So if you had various theories, right? So firms started telling if there's a rotor, it's moving around. You should be able to use dominant frequency which is to analyze EGM frequency at various parts of the atria and see if you're actually dealing with a rotor. So the, how is this done? You get local voltage. You do a fast Fourier transform. You get a DF. You can do a time delay plot. And subsequently, you can give a color code to various parts of the action potential if you're doing an experimental study where it's an animal study. This is optical mapping so that you can get transmembrane voltage. And you can display that on a color map. So this is a plot of each point in space, and that's kind of how you, you know, can provide a display of a rotor uh, optical map in animal studies. So what you see over here is the definition of a point of phase singularity, which is the central pivot around which the rotor rotates. So this is the current status of where uh, mechanisms of fibrillation stand and what is ablatable and what is not. So if you look at sustained reentry, you know, yes and no. Uh, 
Sometimes, if you're lucky enough to target it, you may be able to get it. It's definitely defibrillatable. Almost all are defibrillatable except multifocal, which is an extremely diseased heart. Some of them are actually type 2 VF, as it's known in the basic science literature, where the, there is extreme sodium channel suppression, which may be a total functional phenomenon. But if you look at this uh, sort of display that we have put in over here, some of these mechanisms, if they indeed operate, we have no idea, they may be ablatable. So the way this stands is um, some of the other mechanisms have very little experimental support of what I've put up. So what is the overall verdict from all the basic science out there? What is ablatable is trigger and reinduce non-sustained multiple wave reentry, or trigger reinduce non-sustained mother rotor reentry. These are two mechanisms that are ablatable. Potentially ablatable is sustained mother rotor reentry with peripheral wave breaks. So you have one rotor, and there is what is in the periphery is wave breaks. So what is not ablatable is of course the mixed mechanisms, and if there is rotor break. Up, which some people think can happen instantaneously. So the m first thing is you're having your lunch, I would say add another packet of salt. Anytime a basic scientist tells you things like this, keep this in mind. These are extremely, extremely unusual settings for looking at a phenomenon. And you can't blame the groups that have done this because there was no other insights to be gained. And indeed, they were able to see a phenomenon in a particular set of conditions. And that has been extrapolated to reality. It's important to keep in mind that there's a lot of mapping studies, even in animals in innovated hearts, including human studies uh, intraoperatively, which have not shown rotors. Uh, this includes data from many, many labs. Uh, this includes uh, Idaker's study. Neil Kay recently was telling me about firm maps they've done. They couldn't see rotors. Multiple groups have reported this. Ralph Damiano's group has not been able to see it. Jonathan Kalman's group from Melbourne, Australia has not been able to see it. So these are the relevant questions. You know, What is uh, uh, the mechanism and the jury is still out? So of course, that doesn't happen. <laughs> the last one was intentionally added by Jim Wise and our basic science team to poke fun at the group because we don't know what the mechanisms are. And if it's just random, yeah, anything random would have a 50% chance of success. So that doesn't tell you what the theory is. But there is at least modeling evidence to say that ablation can impact both mother rotor and um, you know, the other mechanisms where the cycle and changes that are seen potentially can be interpreted based on rotor hypothesis from a basic science perspective. Right? So because this is about how a rotor can live inside tissue. So let's not get into the details of this, but I can just highlight the fact that it's plausible. At least FIRM deals with contact EGMs, whereas non-invasive ECGI for atrial fibrillation relies on even weaker sources of signals. So I'm going to skip this one uh, slide, but I'll come to this major slide and last few slides are coming up, and that is, how big should a circuit that can sustain a rotor be? This is an adult human heart. This is a mouse heart. And that's an embryonic mouse heart. All of these can sustain fibrillation. And all of these can have some form of rotor-based uh, fibrillation that can be defined. So put that in perspective. And there was a recent major debate on the confirmed trial where there was a crosstalk that was published of the pros and cons where Dr. Halife and Dr. Narayan uh, clearly say, firmly say that low spatial panoramic mapping, as they call it, identifies rotors. Dr. Alessi has worked on this for the past 45 years, thinks it does not. And they have a lot of data, both humans and experimental, to say that rotors don't exist. So we wandered into this controversy because we had 23 cases and we spent an obscene amount of time. <laughs> we spent eight to nine hours per case analyzing this. And we actually had Sanjeev Narayan there because we think that it's very important to get this scientifically established. Our group does not have any IP or any conflicting data or interest in this space. And it's one of those John Wooden lines. We care about what is right and not who is right. So we did this study, and it's uh, the next few slides are going to talk about the study that was just 
published in Sir Keepith's editorial. So we did this, and we refer to these as the basket cases, literally. So you can see this, the kind of EGMs, the data you get. And these were done with enormous care and attention, do, using atrial angiograms, choosing the uh, cases. In fact, vast majority of these patients had a uh, left atrial size was uh, four something, which is the largest. So they were excluding every case, you know, large case, this and that. These were highly selected to begin with. In other words, the catheter has to fit. So the first issue we identified was atrial coverage. You'll find that no matter how you position these basket catheters, there's a lot of atria that is not sampled by these catheters. That was the first finding of this paper. The second thing is we did quantitative analysis, and I don't want to waste and you know, go beyond my time for this session, and it's all the details are in the paper, where we did extremely fine analysis of the EGMs that were recorded from those cases. So we did unipolar analysis of EGMs, and in fact, that's the whole concept of this paper. Then we also looked at all the other available theories. There's a group in Australia that says Shannon entropy maps show that there is some subtle evidence of a rotor in a human heart. Dominant frequency maps. So we did every one of these. It took us a year and a half just to analyze this data from just 23 cases. So we looked at these two maps. Subsequently, we did a detailed results of frequency domain and entropy analysis of this, uh, of the cases that in which we did extremely detailed mapping. All right? Essentially, the distribution here shows we find no evidence of a rotor. We also did um, painful analysis, manual analysis of each one of those channels. So you can imagine there are 64 channels, 40 channels give you good data. You have to pick up each one of these channels and annotate each one of these EGMs as if you were doing a case, right? If you're doing a macro reentered case, except that this rhythm is changing. So you can't just identify a few seconds of it. You had to do that for a continuous stretch. So we did that kind of analysis. And that was a very, very important finding. And this really is what nailed the whole study for us. So one of the fundamental precepts of a rotor is you cannot change chirality. So a rotor cannot behave like a politician. It has to stay in one stance and remain in that stance. So what you see over here is a chirality change. If a rotor is rotating in one direction, it cannot change its direction of rotation. Okay, that's only reserved for politicians. So we saw change in chirality within a few beats, and that completely tells you that you can see periodic rotational activity. That does not mean that it's a rotor, or you can't say that it's actually a mechanism that's driving fibrillation. Therefore, on the con side, what the study shows is in these 24 patients in whom we did very detailed mapping done by you know, the world expert in the procedure itself, uh, this is what we found. You know. We found AFib termination in N of one, just one case. And that too, it happened a couple of minutes later, and nowadays they have the feeling that if you ablate a site and five minutes later AFib terminates, they give credit to that site. I thought if you extend that theory, you know, later, the next day if AFib terminates, you can say that it's because of what you ablated too. So why that is the case, but we did give that, you know, the three minute window for it. Uh, that's based on one animal study, by the way where they say that you know, in an in in optical mapping sheet, uh, if you did an intervention and three minutes later something stopped, they say, oh, it's because of what you did. Um, it's almost like stock market where they say post hoc propter hoc. If, <laughs> if B happens, uh, you, you just say whatever happened before that, you can say it's a cause and effect. Um, so then slowing of AF cycle length was seen in eight cases. And we now know, you saw that today in Andrea's case. Cycle and slowing occurs, and has nothing to do with whatever we claim as a mechanism. That happens when you ablate at certain areas of the atrium. We don't understand that scientifically. So this is something that they took credit for that. So what was happening was, first they said everything terminates. Then they said, oh, there is some cycle and slowing. Subsequently, they said, just ablate what we think are rotors and just look at follow-up. So each one of those precepts are wrong. We couldn't see termination. And we saw cycle and slowing in an in a underwhelming number of cases. And the clinical follow-up data, which was not reported in this paper, basically shows 
that the success rate of the procedure is way inferior to a PVI to the extent we are now reluctant to randomize patients for firm versus PVI. So, and we did this in what I just showed you, which is uh, electron atomic mapping showed no rotational activation at firm identified sites in 23 out of 24 cases, manually done, manually physically done. So our conclusion is firm identified rotors do not exhibit any qualitative EGM characteristic expected from rotors, and it did not differ quantitatively from surrounding tissue. Catheter ablation of these sites in conjunction with pulmonary vein isolation resulted in AF termination or organization only in a minority of patients, and this is much lower than the confirmed trial. The clinical follow-up data, which combines data from Dr. Ellen Bogan's lab and our lab, was just presented at HRS at the same time where Dr. Natali's initial results from their study was also presented. And uh, our results are completely divergent to what Dr. Pristarsky and their team report, and they have uh, you know, spectacular success rates. We are not seeing that, and uh, uh, we were told that this is because of inexperience, but it was done by the, you know, the most experienced person on planet Earth in that procedure. Uh, truly, we don't have an ego in this. We have to get it right for the field. So I would encourage many of these uh, uh, you know, fellows and you know, the next generation of electrophysiologists to think, AFib is a mess. This is what mapping studies are. And you have to make sense of this. And one proposal that we made to all the EP labs in the world was share EGM data. We are happy to share our data in a de-identified way. Space scientists do this all the time. When they look at the skies, when satellites record uh, data, the Hubble telescope records data of various parts of the sky, many groups in the world share that data and they analyze it. So I think we need to get that type of analytics because something cannot just be seen by one person or one group using their own little colored glass. Um, all what we see in science has to be reproducible. And others must and should be able to interpret your data. And if they cannot arrive at the same conclusion by using another test, then it really questions whether a certain concept exists. And later, if we have uh, offline discussions, we can talk a lot more. Um, and I like to sort of provoke Pepe Halife a lot on this and Jim Wise, both of them, and say, you guys both have two different theories of this, but I think both of you are looking at a, an artifact in basic science, which is the optical maps. So, and we can talk more about this. So the big conclusion is that I think, uh, will firm alone be superior to standard treatment? I think no, because no matter how much you do this, uh, it's PVI and the posterior wall isolation that works. So if you really want to search a wave, come to California. You can be looking for a wave, but you're not going to find it in the heart. So we need to find out why these therapies work. And uh, this confounding mess has to be solved. And don't forget the fact, I'm giving you a quote from uh, an ancient quote from my country. Hail to thee, O physician, you're the brother of Yamaraja, who's the god of death. You're the elder brother of even the god of death because Yama takes life, where you take life and money too. <laughs> so it's a lot of uh, expense, you know. And uh, another statement from my country, which I'm always fascinated by, is, you know, when the dust settles, you'll know if you've been riding a horse or an elephant. So keep that in mind, you know. It's... Uh, we can all sit here and say theories, but ultimately the biggest test is patience and trying to understand mechanisms. And when that happens, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, Sometimes I'm even happy to take an outcome such as AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which to date we don't understand what the circuit is and what the true mechanism of the arrhythmia is, but it works. At least the success rates are very high. And maybe it won't be like WPW. So I'll stop here and we still have an adequate time for uh, the discussion piece, and and thank you for allowing us to restructure this because the my co-chairs of the session, Dr. Callens and Natalie, wanted this to be presented. Thank you so much.